and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and you're listening to episode 129 with Pierre Gill, DP of the Percy Jackson TV show. Enjoy. Because you guys did, um, what'd you do? Um, the, Bl- the Blade Runner shorts, Blade. right? Yeah, I shot the Blade Runner shorts. Um because I was second unit DP on Blade Runner with four Deacons. Mm. And then uh, Ridley Scott wanted uh, to do some promotions, so we did some boards with uh, Batista, right? Yeah, Ridley too and Batista. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So, basically, we did some uh, short um, kind of promotion film for Blade Runner with uh, Jared Leto and one with uh, Batista. Yeah. So, I think uh, I saw those on the Blu-ray. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was great. What what were you, what was your gig on uh, second unit? I I I uh, I actually second enjoy second form. unit jobs. They they feel like almost easier. Actually, I love second unit because yes, you are um, you have more time. You're doing the big shots, like a lot of big action sequence. Everything is long. Everything is slow. And so it's much better than being on set all day and going crazy with like, you know, touch up, makeup and go, 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 go. So a second unit is, is nice. I love it. Especially like on Blade Runner, of course, you have the task of trying to, uh, not trying, you have to match Deacons. <laughs> right. So there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no way out. You gotta, you gotta figure out to make sure it looks like what he's doing. So this is cool because this is something I learned to do and I've done it pretty good with the kids actually I think he was very happy because he mentioned me in the uh, ASC magazine article yeah. so, uh, and, and I know he, 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 he disliked and he hates the second unit a lot so I think it was a very good thing that he, he talked about me he was happy with the, the, the shot and then I done also uh, for Greg Frazier I done I finished the movie Dune mm. With Denis Villeneuve, because Denis and Greg shot Dune 1, and after they went to editing, they realized they were missing some scenes, key scenes, and Greg Frazier was doing the Batman. So Denis Villeneuve called me and asked me if I wanted to come and, and shoot the scenes, and actually it was a lot. I ended up shooting probably the 10, at least the 10 first minute of the movie, it's all my stuff. Wow. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's like all the breakfast scene and all the uh, Jason Momoa coming with his like uh, spacecraft and talking with uh, Mati Chalamet and telling him like you gain some weight and Mm -hmm. and all the with this uh, Timothy and his father with uh, the funeral at the funeral. and all the, uh, the the treaty when they signed the treaty, so so yeah, like a big chunk. I didn't know I was going to do so much. Then he said like, "Oh, I have to reshoot it. I'm going to shoot a new scene, but you know, it's mostly we have to pick up some, uh, we have to pick up some shots into some scenes to 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 put. So basically, uh, one shot and we make the morning. Uh, is it? Did I say that right? Not Rebecca De Morning, that's another actress. Okay, so basically one shot with Rebecca Ferguson. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. That is in the middle of a scene. So this is really hard. You have to match. Like you have to match to the dot. No, 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 no possibility. And also I've done this also on arrival for uh uh Brandon. Uh, Bradford Young. Bradford Young. I'm sorry, I'm glitching. You're gonna have to edit that up because yeah, that, that, that's why I, I take I, notes now. I was just yeah. telling Measure Smith, I'm like, yeah, I uh, I do notes now. I actually n- take note of when I'm supposed to cut stuff oh, or just person. or just remember things. I'm so bad. The one thing that the reason I bring it up earlier about like, have you heard this? Is because I uh, now there's someone vacuuming. Um, I'll like, you'll be saying something and I'll get really excited and then I'll jump off topic to a different topic and I never come back. So I was was like, now I should just use, we have pencils, we're adults. Uh, Perfect. But um, what, I mean, that that work with Denise um, must have been, uh, oh, there my iPad died too. We're just having all kinds of technical glitches. Um, The uh, work with Denise seems to have been really, uh, uh, 
it's worked out for you. <laughs> You've gotten some cool, uh, cool gigs under your belt. Yeah. And I shot it, uh, one of his first movie when he came back there doing films, which is called Polytechnique. Yeah. The black and white side. Uh, yeah. So I was DP on that. And then I know Danny really well. And of course he moved on to uh, getting like uh, some very big Hollywood movies after that. And, but I was very happy when he called me for this because it's, uh, it's, a uh, a big proof of course of confidence and to be, uh, it's a huge task and I'm very proud and I'm very happy to have done it. You did bring up though, uh, shooting second unit. I love talking to people who have done like really good second unit because, um, you know, we always think, especially talk about people like, um, uh, deacons and whatnot, you know, they're obviously they're the masters of their craft. And then oftentimes there are people like you or, or any other second unit that have to replicate that. And it, and it can't be a pastiche and it can't be reminiscent of their look. It has to be exact. And I was wondering what are, um, kind of some of the keys of people like Bradford or, um, Roger that, uh, you have to lean into to make sure that those things look exact. It's, it's, uh, it's very important and it's very hard because the problem is because they're in the middle of shooting. So the project is not finished. So basically, first of all, when you see dailies, it's not the final look. So there's a recipe behind the recipe, meaning your final, final look is like going in the dark room, you know? So you take pictures with a 35 millimeter film, you go in a dark room. This is where you finish your picture. You know, you do the dodging, you make the sky darker, blah, 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 blah. So then you have to figure out what they're doing and they're busy. So Roger Deakins, I, I barely talked to him. So I came in, Hey, hi, very nice to meet you. And, uh, then, uh, he was like, thanks for coming in. And he walked away. It's so about in line is about this. So then I have to spy. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking at, I'm trying to see what he's doing. I'm trying to understand, but it's pretty weird because a DP is, uh, uh you're, you're a, an artist, even if it's a highly technical and it's very, you know, like the management and all that, but you have your own style. So it's very hard to recreate somebody's style. So then I had to kind of like understand, okay, what's the real contrast? What's the real color? What is he putting in the camera? Is there filters and this and that? Of course, it's his job to tell me what he's putting because I'm supposed to work for him. But with him, I had to figure out on my own a lot. And uh, then I try to understand the core and the basic. But when I got there, you know, they have been shooting for already 35 days. I went there for the last four months, so I don't get all the info. I have to really figure it out, and then and, and that's what I did. And then I try to understand, and I, I'm I'm very meticulous for that. I'm I'm good to do this actually, and I think it's a very good quality as a DP. If you can mimic another DP exactly, it's a very good thing. Yeah, it doesn't mean you're a bit better DP, but it means you're 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 highly qualified. Because and you have this very hard. good eye too. Being able to replicate is is difficult. It's very hard. And you know what? For example, when I worked with Bradford Young and he shot Arrival, and then again, I came the same thing. I, I go there like uh, five months later because it, they're going to reshoot. And then I have to reshoot stuff that goes exactly in a scene. So you're cutting right. to a scene, to my shot, to another shot, to a scene, to my shot, to a shot. And then I, I talked to him and said, hey, uh, cool. So what lens did you use? And he goes, oh, I use some like uh, uncoated Zeiss, uh, but there's only one kit in the world. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to get that. No, it's not available. So they were like, okay, so then I have to match your movie, not using the same lens. Wow, this is pretty crazy. So... Mm -hmm. What I've done, I made my own mats in my head. So I took the same type of lens that were not uncoated. And I told him, I said, I'm going to change your contrast ratio. I'm going to change the way you shot because I'm going to make the image softer in a certain way in the lighting. So once you bring it back together, it should get closer together. And it worked. And I did that and it worked. So, but this is, you see, it's, you need experience to know that. I swear to God, it's like, oh, yeah. have to figure it out. Was there, uh, what kind of things did you learn from, uh, having to, you know, roughly, obviously, um, I feel like, uh, second unit is kind of like paint 
restoration people, you know, like paint restorers, uh, must learn a lot from having to mimic the brush strokes of, of the paintings they restore. I imagine, um, doing second unit has been pretty educational and, and helped you in your further work. Absolutely. And that's why I love it because what it did, it's like, first of all, it gets you very, uh, precise. It's good for your job because you become more precise. Then the other thing you learn during second unit is big shots, like big, because I ended up with shoots, uh, you know, with stunts and eight camera set up, the drone, three techno cranes, a cable cam. At the same time, you know, with huge stunts going, blowing up away, and then you're in those me mega gigantic setups. So then, trust me, you learn a lot. You yeah. know, this is really fun. And then, uh, so so with Deacons, you know, I learned, I, you know, I've never used a, a, a four-point cable cam, and there was the, this shot. Like the football cameras? Exactly. Yeah. Because you have to... For, for a, a feature film, you have to get the equipment and build it for a week. You know, it's like in a football field, it's it's permanent. Right. It's going around like this, but it's a huge huge deal that is a huge rigging that is done already. But for uh, uh, Blade Runner, we had to bring it to Budapest from London with the, the four construction crane to all these four points. And every all the movement was created on a computer to, to do the the shot they wanted to do on the preview. Uh, so stuff like that, you know? So this is like a thing that I've never done before, of course. And the other thing that I didn't shoot much, which I learned, which is great because I'm Percy Jackson and it helped me a lot because with Blade Runner, there's a lot of water and I shot part of the sequence with uh, Harrison Ford, you know, when they crash at the end and Harrison Ford is, is stuck into the, 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 the spinner, the, the yeah. spacecraft, and this is going underwater. So we use like big, gigantic techno crane with hybrid camera that dip underwater and uh, a lot of things like this. So it's it's one of the cool thing about second unit is you you you're gonna end up doing the shot with whatever the horse going through the the, the yard. You're gonna end up doing like uh, the stunt following from the roof. So. It's, you have more time, and this is what you don't have time to do on first unit. That's what there's a second unit, you know. It's like impossible. It's too long to do these shots. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always feel like the, the I've said this before to a, a in a couple episodes, but I feel like the second unit gets to do all the stuff that we, when we're young and we like get into film school, we're like, that's what we want to do. Especially when you're around my age, when it's like, yeah. you watch all these special effects films and stuff and you're like, I want to do that. It's like, well, that was, yeah. you want to be second unit. You don't want to be a DP. Yeah. Exactly. You want to be but charged. you're, you're the DP who decides of like, uh, you know, so at the end, Blade, Blade Runner is Deacon Vision, you know, so mm -hmm. my shot that I put in there is fun, but he's, he's the, the creator of that. Uh, and also some of the shots, it's not always the same, but with Deakins and Denis, Denis Villeneuve, of course, he's a precise man. It's not like, uh, hey, you know, uh, shoot me a few guys punching each other. No, 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 no. Nobody, it's not the stunt coordinator who's going to decide how the guy will punch the other one. Trust me. Right. It's super precise. Uh, you have to follow Deakins order like to the dot and Denis. And, and it's so, this is a different type of second unit. It's extremely precise. You can get into a, maybe, maybe some Mission Impossible stuff would be a bit more loose, you know. Uh, let's follow a Tom Cruise with his motorcycle in Paris. Of course, let's put as many camera, go with the drone, uh, put a long lens, pan to the cars. Of course, it's all precise, but some of it is also a bit improvised, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, oh, lost that thought. Shit. Whatever. Um, <laughs> oh no, that's what I was gonna say. I, uh, I was talking to Eric Messerschmidt earlier today. Um, and uh, I was telling him I got to see Ferrari, but the Q and a was with Denis and Michael Mann. Denis was interviewing Michael Mann. And, uh, that was a fascinating conversation to sit in on to see. And they talked for like an hour, you know, to see the two of them and watch them kind of bounce off each other. And then they were just hanging out, eating snacks outside with everyone else. And I was like, you guys didn't run away. So there was, you know, I got to like meet him and stuff there. Um, 
It was cool That's to see like cool. two two minds like that really, and and like you're saying, like the precision, and also something that I really appreciate about Denis now hearing him talk is like his um his emotion towards film. Like uh, something I've always said is like emotionally correct is more often correct than technically correct, and he seems to be one of those directors that really. Um, has has a love uh, an actual like borderline romantic love with the material oftentimes yeah then he's so great and you know when you work with him he's like first of all you'll never put two camera in a mm. scene it's one camera at a time that's it interesting uh on on on, on dune i was uh, sometimes i had the opportunity i said look i can give you a second shot and he was like here don't do that you're gonna kill me. And I was like, okay, no problem. We've done it only once, I think, in the cemetery because uh, we ran out of time seriously. But first of all, he goes shot by shot. And second of all, it's like, what's great with him is like, he's really thinking. You see him and you can, if you see making out, you can see he's looking down, he closed his eyes, he's looking down, doesn't talk much. He's really a interior guy. And then, he shoots and then he's gonna go okay he talks to the actor and then he shoots again he goes okay cut okay moving on and you're like okay good so we do the, the next shot no don't need it anymore good done moving on that's nice to so, have a director <laughs> oh my god it's so good it's like uh, on june he was doing this until we were we had a, a plan for a few things and then he was like no i'm good i was like okay perfect that's it so it's very, very good. He's very precise and he has a vision and you see that it works because his movies are great, you know. But what's great about this, it's that uh, he, he, he builds a story and so, because overshooting is not necessarily a good thing, you know, right. because what happened, of course, the editor has a big part, but the problem is sometimes when you try to fix the movie in editing or change it, that's a problem. And the biggest problem with editing, and it happened more, you know, in television, of course, is because in television, you have to do more coverage, more close up. Uh, you can do, you can barely leave the scenes with just two actors talking in a frame. They're always going to say, oh, they do a close up, it's a close up, it's a close up. And the problem is this if you, if you start, you shoot your movie, you're finished, okay? Or your TV show, you're finished. You put it in editing. The first thing's gonna happen is gonna be like, of course, the first cut will be too long. It's gonna be like uh, an hour and a half instead of, let's say, 50 minutes. Now, <laughs> then you have to trim what's too much. You try to figure out the story point, make it work. Once you have it, the problem is this, is that is once you have it and you're happy and you start looking at it, it's great. But if you see it two times, three times, four times, five times, 10 times in editing, you're going to say, hey, you know what? It's a little slow. Why don't you try this shot of the guy when he was running around? And then you add one shot. And then suddenly, wow, it feels good because it's new. Right. And then you add another one. And then you add another one. And that's why sometimes you saw some TV shows, it cuts like nonstop. And it's not a good thing. It's, a, it's something that happens because it, you see that your, your movie or your TV show too often in editing and it's if it's good then me you know what when i work i work like this i watch dailies so or on set okay so on set i always have my sound i'm I always have a come tech i'm listening to the actors talking so if i do the camera or, or i have camera operators i don't mind i always have sound because my image doesn't go without sound right i'm not doing a silent film i'm doing a, a film with sound and then I want to feel if my camera is moving properly. Is it too fast? Is it too this? Is this at a good moment? And then I see sometimes I'm like looking, I'm like, okay, good cut. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, are you happy? Yeah, that's fine. Sometimes I'm like, I, I, I see it. I'm like, okay, from here to here was magic. Mm. Super powerful. Done. Take this, put it in the other thing. Put the other piece, put the other piece. Done. You don't have to overdo it. It's good, and you should not look at it anymore. Let the audience look at it later. So this is this is the law. 
Well, and and I feel like too, I was, it's funny, I was just saying that, you know, I did three interviews today. Uh, I was just talking to uh, Matt Lloyd about uh, origin and, you know, with Ava DuVernay. And uh, he was saying how how singular vision she is and how like dialed. Um, and we were kind of talking about the same thing. We're like the fire hose cover. Well, they were shooting on film too and they had no budget, but like not no budget, but a low budget. Um, but the idea of that fire hose coverage, I feel like is it's very safe on set to say, um, oh, well, we'll just we'll cover it so that we have options. But then when when you default to that, let's have options mentality, that singular vision doesn't come through and it doesn't feel like a, a storyteller is telling you a story. It feels like you're being presented with clips, which is not very yeah. compelling. And I feel like even an uneducated audience in, in terms of um, uh, yeah. uh, film, not uneducated, like stupid, uh, an uneducated audience can tell. They can tell when it when it's been kind of overmanaged. Absolutely. Because it's a human brain understand these things. That's why exactly people are not stupid. Even if you think thinking like some people are like exactly undicated audience or uh, the, the thing is this: the subconscious, some sub subconscious understands something and knows. That's why we pay so much attention to details sometimes. Uh, you know, my girlfriend she's not in movies and uh, she's new to this and and she's. Can her belly? She's like, wow, you're really doing this? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put some snow in the background over there because if I don't put a piece of white and I'm inside the house, it doesn't feel like winter. Right. Yeah, but you don't see there. Yeah, but the brain sees it. So this detail, if I make it right, well, you know what's happened? It's like the, 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 the audience is following the actor and the emotion better. When there's a glitch, when something is wrong, I swear to God, if you do fake rain, then behind you, the rain is stupidly crazy. And it's not supposed to be a hurricane show. You know, it's not a tornado with uh, shards. It's like, it doesn't work. So you cannot do that. And people will notice right away, even if they, they don't even know. The only thing they will say after a scene is something is bothering me. I don't know what it is. Yeah. And so we pay, we pay attention to a lot of stuff. You know, uh, for me, it's always when you see a lot of rain, it's usually at night and then you can see a puddle in the back, but there's no rain hitting that puddle. Yeah. I'm always like, oh, that's just some PA with a hose over the can over the car. I uh, man, this is very frustrating because it happened often, even on big budget. Yeah. It's very hard, these things. Uh, but to, actually that brings up something I wanted to talk about later, but we'll talk about it now because... Uh, you know, the segues are fun. Um, you on uh, Percy Jackson, you shot a lot of volume stuff, I read. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, not that it's new technology uh, in that most people know about it now, but it is a, a really new technology. You know, it's very, um, you know, you're probably one of, I don't know, 10 like major productions that have actually used it to any degree. Um, yeah. how were you able to, how much of it was volume? Cause I couldn't even really tell watch. I mean, I, I only saw a handful of episodes. Um, fortunately I didn't have a ton of time before I, when I got back from Colorado, but, uh, couldn't tell, but also how were you able to make it look realistic? I read in an article that, that, uh, part of it was making it not look realistic, made it look realistic. Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy if you tell me that. You didn't notice, or you don't even know which which was shot on a volume on the, the show because there was a lot, and there was a lot of extremely difficult situations. Mm. So, bottom line, so that's why, and I I really put my blood onto this because it was so hard. The thing is, this is like it was my first time with a volume, but I learned fast, okay, and I work with Deacons of Blade Runner and Dune, so. I'm okay. I can figure it out. Give me the info. I'm going to understand. I'm good. I have a good instinct. So I'm good to try to figure it out. And then I made some research and all that. So that's fine. Now, the thing I didn't know, and I was working with Iron, which are the best, you know, so they did Mandalorian and all of this, uh, Boba Fett and all the amazing stuff. <clears throat> and the thing I did not know, and the thing I realized that they did not know also, mm -hmm. is that 
we try to do realist realism and you can't you can barely do it so this is where i sweat a lot and then with my great friends at at island that we started to you know because the show that we tried to do with percy was one thing not adventures not superhero not over the top let's make a a, a, a series with a down-to-earth guy a real character uh, real kids that are like uh, going through a journey and my take was to to make it realistic natural natural but with an end like you know gorgeous and nice and disney-ish a bit without going to super like uh you know poppy and like uh over the top and be watching whatever right so <laughs> well i mean it's like the oh the big blue sky and right, right. thing but i try to keep color i wanted to keep color because i'm missing it because everything is desaturated now everything is monochromatic and i'm like it's easy to do monochromatic i swear to god if you want to do color it's difficult so anyway to come back to the volume what happened is that we started by doing the exterior met which is the first scene almost the first scene of the show and it's so this is all volume but oh my friend the, the museum was volume yeah the oh, exterior and me. the interior yeah that yeah that wasn't where i would have pointed <laughs> both of them and actually the interior was a, was really a uh, a success okay because we yeah. worked and, and what was it strange is because i didn't know but they came up with the shots because what they do they go shoot they went to shoot the exterior met and the interior met the museum with like uh digital cameras and they grab everything and they create a 3d museum which is a real museum but then when they showed me the interior museum i was like okay so now i what do i do i need to light it and they were like well no it's lit i said no it's not lit it's lit by the allergen lamp that you shot at the museum i'm not i'm a dp i'm gonna light it so so they were like yeah okay so i said no 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 no. i have to light this i'm going to relight this so they went okay so we we use a 3d structure and all of the interior is relit by me the bound the thing all the concept of what i wanted to the light to look like to try to make it work also as best as possible in the volume because you have to understand that you have some creative choices but they come to reality quick. So you don't, it's not like, oh yeah, I wanted to do exactly that. No, I wanted to do something else, but I could not achieve that at the moment. But it's okay. I mean, it's part of the the, the game of what you do every day on any, you know, production. So we relight, we relight it. We do some tests in the volume and it's starting to look really cool. Um, now, the thing is this, at the same time we do the exterior, and we put it on the volume to test it and it starts to be very difficult because it doesn't look real now then we realize with ilm also they realize that it's like this is what is the reality about that if you do star trek star wars mandalorian anything that has the word sci-fi or fantasy your brain like i was talking about the subconscious will accept the fakeness of it the not the reality of it so even if it looks super good i, I mean like the the Mandalorian and all that looks amazing but it doesn't look real 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 you know so you're okay first of all the costume are different the people who are wearing masks and makeup and stuff like that and star trek for example where if you read like you you have red and blue stripes and white stripe with black thing it's and the background is very like you know like uh, click 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 with lines it's not an organic type of set right. and then uh, when we go into the volume to do a exterior realistic set it's like it was very hard so after a lot of sweating and a lot of like uh, fixing and a lot of this and that we ended up with a pretty decent volume um so i'm very happy at the moment a lot of people uh are don't don't know about what was volume or not some people know of course but a lot of it had some touch up but not a lot of touch up so this is a really good news because that's the goal when you should volume you know you have to touch up in vfx 
first of all, because there's a ceiling and you have cameras right. and there you have to raise them. So just basically like that. But so what I've done in that volume is that the first thing is like, and, and, and to talk about per scene, generally speaking, when I started my prep, what I, what I did is my, my hanker was the volume because I knew we were going to have about, let's say we had planned 30% of the shoot was volume, for example. Oh, wow. Okay. So I cannot do anything else than start my test in the volume. So that my camera package, my lenses and all the prep I've done is only inside the volume. So I just did 100 lenses. I wanted to shoot anamorphic. I wanted to have no flares in these lens. I didn't want a Panavision lens with a flare, like an Amy right. and cool stuff. Because I, because the problem with this is like, if the lamp is not, is, uh, is only, cause I'm going to put lights in that volume, but the that volume arch directed in post. Well, no, it's not that it's because the, if I, if I cheat the sun, I can put a little light in the volume to, to cheat the sun and we can erase the, the tripod, but this light is 30 feet away from you. So it doesn't work. If the mm -hmm. flare will tell you that you're too close, it doesn't work physically. So I didn't want to have flares. I wanted to have blooms and very little flares, of course. So at the end, I found the cook lenses, the big, like very heavy, amazing anamorphic. Yeah, those lenses. cook, those good thing. Those cook anamorphics are like this big. The oh, size they're of gigantic. <laughs> yeah, they're gigantic. My study camera operator was like looking at, oh no. Like, crazy. I was about to uh, make a handheld very heavy. There's so much glass inside there, but they're gorgeous. The thing is that they are beautiful for faces and skin and this is really fun. And then, so what I did, I did that and I took a Venice because then the mix with those two, those two, uh, elements. So the cook and the Venice too became a very, very lovable mix for the volume. So I had a clean image, but not too clean. And also very velvety because I, I got uh, William F. White in Canada. They went through four kit of my lenses, four sets of my cook lenses, and I asked them to, to detune them. So they spent 1,000 hours to detune every lens one by one. So that was an achievement, really. Yeah, yeah, it was unbelievable. And what happened with this is they, they got the flare to be just out, but also the lens to bloom, and I call them the velvet. They were PG velvet. So what happened with this, it actually the volume was very pleasant because it was soft enough, so the screen was just blending better in the camera, but still it was sharp enough to be what you see on TV, which is quite, it's actually quite sharp, crisp, yeah. but it's not disturbing. It's not because I, I hate crisp, you know, and VPs, you need, we like film, and we like the grain and we like all this. But when I, I'm looking at the, the, the series on my screen, my TV uh, at home, and I'm, I'm quite happy to be honest with you. I'm like, wow, it looks pretty good. So that was a, one of the big thing to find this. And when I found my lens, I never even tested my camera outside ever. Mm -hmm. The only test I've done is in a volume. And when I was like, yeah, this is working done. And then the only work I started doing was really to figure out how to do those volumes. So at the end, there's a lot. There's like the exterior met, interior met, uh, there's the minotaur, uh, crash, the car inside the car, the crash outside, the mom talking with Percy in the rain with the car lighting your face, uh, which I love it. This is where you see this lens of dark origin. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all the minotaur fight. Um, uh, I mean, this is only episode one, you know? Yeah. I, well, I thought I was going to say that I thought it was the, um, the camp, the, the camp, but like, I saw that you guys built a real camp. Yes, exactly. So part, part of the camp is in a volume. Part of it is outside. Part of it is inside a stage. So that was also a very difficult because I gotta, I gotta figure out how to make these to be all the same path, you know? Yeah. So what, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up those lenses cause you're totally right. Like there's this wonderful velvet, I guess is the, the proper word now that I know, but I was going to say there's this wonderful creaminess, but everything's super, like not super sharp, not annoyingly sharp, but like, especially in close ups, just everyone looks uh, incredibly the eyes are, clean. Yeah. You see their eyes are like, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So, so this this lens is great because what it does, it's just nice enough for the skin to get the curse out of the skin. Mm. But you look at the eyes, and what we did is like, first of all, I use this 55 macro and the 75 millimeter a lot because they're a good distance. And to be anamorphic, what is very important of anamorphic, you're close to the actor. And I love that because you feel it. Even on an iPhone, I watch it, I'm like, yeah. So in the opening of episode one, there's a shot of Percy like doing his voiceover and he's in the lightning and he comes into a super big close-up. If you look at this shot again, watch it. This is a 65 macro and when he comes close, you see he's there. He's perfectly there. It's, he's with yeah. you. And the fact that it's anamorphic, at this point, he was maybe three, three feet away, one meter away from the land. So it's around, it's round. So the difference between spherical and amorphic, the spherical, you would be eight feet away, so it's flat. So you're not as close as the actor, and you don't feel the roundness. You don't see the side of the face. It makes it more two-dimensional. Right. So this shot is a nice example if people want to understand what is an amorphic. Look at this opening shot of Percy Jackson in his close-up, and he comes in there. Then with the lightning, you see his eyes. And you see how beautiful these lenses are, like gorgeous. Yeah. And you said they were modified what again? Oh, the Cooks. Um, uh, they, they were, they're Cook uh, 2X anamorphic ICE S35 series. Mm. But I got them, I got uh, William F. White to detune them. But that was a big thing because nobody wants to touch these lenses. I mean, even <laughs> Cook doesn't want me to do that, which I understand. So what we've done is there's this uh, Alex Theodore at uh, William F. White. He said, I'm going to try. And then there was one thing, there was one technical problem I didn't like because they made a, a flare with an orange line in it. Mm. And that's uh, orange dot, sorry. And that was a big problem that I have to get, uh, go around it. And he was able to make it disappear. And I was like, okay. So from there, I said, okay, can you try? So we tried only three lenses at the beginning. And then he understood what to do because he spent at least two weeks for three lens just to figure out how to open it, close it. I mean, there's like the glass in there is all made in England, like and made. It's it's crazy. So it was quite an uh, an accomplishment. In yeah. with you, it's like so. Did, um, so the anamorphic obviously is like one element of it, but what what in your mind? Uh, kind of gives it this sort of blockbustery look that it has because I don't know what your guys' schedule was but it does have I know you said you didn't want it to look too like a hero you know superhero but it does kind of have that same flavor of like a Marvel film in terms of it's very high quality great color separation as you were saying great sat you know vibrance and 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 um it's it definitely has that kind of look to it and I was wondering I I'd seen uh, online, a few like um, lighting master classes you had done, and and it, I wouldn't say that your style has changed very much over the years, but like obviously not everything you've shot has been sort of a blockbuster thing. So um, if there's a question in there, uh, <laughs> you could answer. Yeah. Um, what is Absolutely. yeah? What is that kind of look to you in this film? And also like, what is your kind of generalized approach to shooting anything? Big soft source backlight. No, no well, listen, it's uh, my my. It's a good point. And my main thing is, yeah, I do have a style, but I have a very polyvalent style. I can do a lot of things, meaning I can do like dirty and hair. I can do like super clean stuff and I can do something like, uh, you know, you shot on Billy Eilish and that's it. It's like, I, I'm pretty much polyvalent. I don't have a very, very like narrow style, which is an advantage probably, but I do have a style in terms of color meanings. I use a, a lot of time. I have like a three color palette in my thing. So I'm creating, I'm creating depth in every shot because I'm changing color. Um, I'm changing the color of my lights in, in layers mm. and I'm, I'm making the shot to expand by doing this. So I think that's one thing I use this on Percy Jackson, of course, a lot. But one of the things that you say there's scope is because my first thing is how much I love lighting. The lighting is not important. What's important is the framing. Mm. So the only important thing 
is to know how to pick up the good lens for the good shot. Because if you put an, uh, so for example, my, my characters, I know that uh, I'm using the 65 on this, this actor and the 75 on that actor. And I know that the 110 will be better on that woman than the 75. Mm. So their faces, that's the first thing. So of course it slows up because of the emotion. You need to m master this first. And I call it a G spot, sorry, but that's what it is for me. It's like there's a sweet spot for a lens that you get exactly. And I tell my operator all the time and my dolly pushers, I'm like, guys, when you go in, you'll see at one point the lens just goes, it explodes. It gets in dimension. So there's some lens you get to exactly there and suddenly the image is big and strong. If you're one feet behind, it's okay. So this is the first thing. That's why you get scope. You find the right lens. And so you see, and we didn't do like the, 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 the superhero stuff, meaning uh, there's not even, there's barely any like low, super wide angle shot to make sure people look big and like that. There's none of it, but still there's scope. So why? Because this is the height also. So yeah, when I use my wider lens, I go lower a bit. I make sure like the distance kicks in. Um, I look at the viewfinder. I'm trying to get the right distance. And I'm like, ah, is it the 35, the 25? I had a great operator, uh, Dean Esselden from Vancouver, which is like one of the top there. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I share with him a lot. So, okay, Dean, come here. Look, this is the 65. I think it's great, but I really like the 55. It feels like we feel more. And he was like, yeah, it's great. Perfect. Let's do it. So, a lot of the scope is the framing. A lot of the scope is the lens, and uh, it's it's really the key of it. Uh, after that, it because some of the set are you know big and and um, different, so it feels like scope. Yeah, as soon as you you have a bit more or like proof, you know you're not in a kitchen and in a kitchen and in a kitchen and in a bathroom. But again, this is not true because if you look at uh, 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 not prisoners, sorry. Uh, the the movie of Denis uh, uh, which I read about Ben. Why uh, don't see the? Give me a second. This is stupid. Uh, Not prisoners. You know, well, no, no. After with the uh, impossible with uh, with uh, the the Mexican uh, mafia. Oh, uh, fucking um, Sicario. Well, thank you. Okay, so you can edit that piece. So, <laughs> yeah. the thing about scope, if you look at Sicario, I mean, super cinematic, there's a lot of scope. So, because Dickens knows how to frame and move the camera and use a lens, because it's, again, what is the scope in that movie? You start in a small little cabana or a small little house in the middle of, like, Texas, then you go... Uh, in a field, then you're out inside a, an office. I mean, when you think about it, there's no scope to that movie, but it feels really scopy. Though, so, because you have, first of all, because you have these also, you need to have these, I call them the trailer shots. Up here, we don't have time. I don't care. We have to do it. Let's do it. It's a trailer shot. You need it, you know, you need it even either for your trailer or because it's for the scope. Mm -hmm. And if you have this, well, then everything else falls into place. So there's some of this, of course, in the per se, because I've done some, but, you know, which one, I don't know. But even the first shot I just talked to, you at the, again, I come back to this shot when Percy walks and gets into a big close-up. Well, it does have scope, because this is like a very juicy, beautiful lens, and he stopped to the perfect place. Uh, with his face, it kicks in. So that's some of it, and yeah. I think, you know, and then after, of course, I try to make it look quite pleasing. It's Disney, so I'm not going to make a dirty, uh, uh, fucked up, you know, like a, a full of grain, uh, dirty, uh, almost black and white thing. Right. I'm going to keep some, I'm going to keep, I'm in Disney World, and I will do something that belongs to them for sure. It's part of like the task, you know, of course, if, uh, uh, it's, it's something you have to respect, you have to try to do. 
but this said, I didn't take any any more uh, in, uh, I didn't take any other movies as reference. The only thing I've done is that I started by, I read the script and then I told the producers when I had my interview, I said, you know, I feel it should be real in a certain way, uh, real, but elegant. Yeah. So it's, it's realism with elegance. Well, it's, and, it, it doesn't look like a kid's show, you know, it, it certainly, well, you know, it, it has elements of things that make a kid show, you know, like we said, like vibrance and, and color and, and, uh, a sense of kind of, um, playfulness, but it, but it's looks, like I said, it looks like any other, um, quote unquote blockbuster TV yeah. show. Yeah. There's good quality. Exactly. I, I did want to ask, uh, about the lighting going to, with the idea of color, um, were you, I assume using a lot of LEDs, were you, was a lot of that color in the grade or were you using more RGB than, um, you know, tungsten or, or white, uh, a daylight balanced light? Uh, like I, for instance, in the, I think it's like the first episode when, uh, when Percy's talking to his, his, uh, stepdad or dad or whoever that is, um, you know, it's very, it's a very colorful scene for being, as we were saying in, in a, in a, in an apartment, you know, is that, is that production design or was that a lot of like RGB type LEDs? No, it's, it's lighting, it's lighting and I do light with color. So I don't work in post, mm -hmm. but of course, because this is like, I'm back to photography and black room, dark room where you have to print your picture and you make your decision. So for me, pose is critical. It's super important. It's one of the reasons why I love the, the digital world also, because I work in a very, I, a very modern way. I'm working, I do my own color correction on set myself, on every shot, every oh, no camera, kidding. all of them. Every shot, I do color correction. I create a lot. I put a CDL. I work with live grade. And every shot has this. So I work with, LED and a board up on a show like this, of course, because I can afford it. So I have this amazing guy called Dan Hutt and he has his board and he's really fast. He's like a crazy video gamer or whatever you call it, but man, it's crazy. So because I'm set up, I had at least 250 to 400 lamps, you know, good, great. It's huge. I don't know. It's like, like when you see the casino on scene, uh, I think you heard six, I think I, there must be 500 to 600 fixtures. So they are all LEDs, they are all the MX, and I do put all the colors before. And then when I finish my, my thing, the daily colorist, they have to bring my dailies exactly the way I've done it. The only thing they tweak is the black level. Sure. That's it. Because the black level is never perfect on set because you don't see properly. Now, the second thing I do is that I take my, uh, photo software. And I take those frames and then I start doing the, the spices on the omelet. Right. So then what I do is this, I say, okay, now, because I don't work, I do my color correction, but it's linear. It's only, I don't change the color of the red. I don't have secondary colors. I don't do this. It's too much. Mm -hmm. But so what I do, for example, all these orange t-shirts, man, it's, it's start to shoot with all these orange t-shirts. So what I've done is what I did is like, I went to my photo uh, software, I took some dailies and then I start doing color correction and tweak uh, and pick up the orange, change the color, change the saturation and, uh, uh add some, whatever, uh, warmth I want to the skin tones or, and, and change my, my mute or cyan, etc. if I want to. And then I, I, I did about 10 fr frames and I sent it to Charles Bonang, who was my colorist, the great colorist. He's super good. He could do this alone, but he was very happy because like, my God, this is extremely precise. So what it does is that he's having fun because he starts with a very strong base because when he went, when he gets the material that is edited, it's already looking pretty good or pretty equal, you know, because it's like there he is. Mm. And then he has my pictures to know that, okay, he wants me to do that. Because sometimes I don't have time. I was I left to, to shoot new uh, TV series after that. So I'm not going to LA to do the color correction. Mm -hmm. So we have to work remotely. But 
I want him to know that, yes, I want you to really, uh, first of all, and I bet color skin tone has to be like that. I don't want any dark brown. I want her to have this beautiful little chocolatey brown that she, she, her skin is like this. And it's, it can very quickly go to a darker brown. I don't want that, you know? So I'm like, you work on this, you have to fix this. Da, 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 da. So that's part of like the scope also, because it's clean. And when you watch it, and I watched it uh, two days ago with my kid, you know, I watched it at five and I was like, it started and was like, wow, it looks pretty good actually. I was very happy because it does look nice, you know, for your, it's pleasing. So it's well achieved and it's well taken care of. Well, I so my colorist oh. is amazing. Sorry, the colorist is amazing, but I, I bring them there and then I say, look, now if you have a week to work, you have a fun week to work because you know what? You can go in the sky in the background, fix the cloud. You can do this, fix this because we have time to do some cool stuff instead of trying to rebuild it all. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hard thing with like, I, I do a lot of freelance coloring, um, because over the pandemic, obviously I wasn't working, I wasn't shooting any video. Um, so I, and, uh, that's been the more difficult thing is trying to explain, especially as a DP, trying to explain to a director, like, no, actually your DP fucked up and this is going to take three days just to like, get it all balanced before we can start talking about how your look isn't there yet. You know? Exactly. Well, my way of working, you get it balanced. And I learned that very quick. I learned that like uh, 10, 14 years ago with the Borgias and the people who showed me this, it was a first day it, I was in Budapest and these guys from color front, well, this young guy, Daniel Farka, he was looking at me and he was looking at me putting with gel and color and this, and I was working with an Alexa, but he could see that I was always calling the, the color, the colorist that for the daily's colorist saying, no, I, it's too, I want the magenta to be like this. I want the cyan to be like this. I want the da, da, da. Then he said to me, Pierre, yeah, I got this thing. It's super cool. It's live grade. And I have this little knob thing and you should try that. And you could control a bit your, your CDL. And I'm not a whiz kid and I'm not a video player and video game, but, you know, I'm not like a, a computer crazy guy, but I kind of understood. And what happened to me, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is it. Because what it did to me is that I finally gained control again of being a DP mm -hmm. because I lost it after being on film. Whether you're on film, you are the total magician. Nobody sees it. There's a box. It's secret. You can light blue and you can see the LEDs. They're going to be orange. Nobody knows. But now with digital, it, and it started with commercial. There's 20 people looking and chipping. Oh, is it? It's a bit too much color. It's a bit too this. And you're like, uh, okay, but that's just a reference. Can we just not talk about it? So then I started to do this very precisely to be able to get everybody to shut up. And it worked because bottom line, right after that, I shot, remember I shot a movie called The Color Me. I don't know if you see this, but if you see it, it looks like my daily. That, that's it. And, and, and plus, 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 and I've done this with some colorists. I work with a really, really uh, high-end colorist in New York. And when I told him, oh, I want you to start for my city, he was, he was upset sure. at, at first. And he was like, well, no, I'm a, I'm a colorist. I was like, yeah, kid, okay, but I don't care. You start from my thing because we start with my look and because I want us to have fun. So blah, blah, blah. He was in New York and I took a plane. A week later, get there, I get into his room, and he's like, hey, Pierre, hi, oh, Pierre, I'm in love with the way you do. It's amazing. And I was like, okay. So for him, he was like, you're right. I put it up, and then it looked good already. So of course I have to clean it up, but it's a, it's a, it's a shorter cleanup. But then the fun part is that then we create a look, and you apply it, and it follows everywhere, like you just said. But you do this. When you start, you don't do this after a week and a half of redoing everything. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's also this process is great for editors and, and musicians that are getting the, the cut and the dealings because they, they are a bit closer to 
to the final thing. You know, so Percy Dailies was looking like those to show, of course, not as beautiful, but it was that in the, it was in that world. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you actually bring up a good point. That was, uh, this is the bad side of me being my own colorist is, uh, when I've been hired, not every time, obviously, but, uh, there have been times when I've been hired to shoot something and I'm so used to like, um, letting something on set go. Cause I know I can fix it. Like, Oh, I'll bring that down or, Oh, that color's a little fucky, but I can fix it. And then I remember, Oh no, I'm not the colorist. You know, I'll be like, oh no, I can do it. And they're like, we have someone. And I'm like, ah, okay, fuck. Cause then they're going to get the footage. Oh, he, I know. He blew it. And I'm like, oh, but I, I know what to fix. <laughs> no, no, but just, but I, I do it. I'll, uh, at least once a day, I do it. I say, okay, I, and let's try this. And I was like, you know, I'll, I'll fix it in post. It's yeah. Like, I'll, I'll get the wall darker there or this and that because it's time consuming. But, um, at the moment I was able to fix it and achieve it because my colorist was sending me, uh, frames, uh, on what I was shooting Dune. So in the morning I would like, uh, you know, get on set on Dune, trying to keep my head into that world and getting, you know, frames from Percy. And then sometimes I have to take notes, you know, so it's long. I put this in Photoshop and then I have to do arrows that the skin is great. The contrast is too dark. I don't want the thing I don't want is crash black. I hate it. I hate it with a passion. So all my thing when I sit velvet because everything I work on is that the black has this beautiful little detail. So even if it has to be contrasted, I'm hoping that it's not crash. Now, to be honest with you at the moment, my TV is that properly, it looks really good. But I know that a lot of people will see this and will say, oh, it's very contrasting, very, it's hyper color because uh, like I would say 90% of television sets are completely destroyed by the manufacturer because it's, they're set to the football game and the freaking hockey game. So it's right. very, very bad for us. A huge problem. That was, uh, literally like the, maybe the first five minutes of my conversation with Messer Schmidt, we were talking about, uh, how. He was saying he doesn't shoot because we were, you know, we're talking about at one point Ferrari and at the same time, the killer. And I was like working with Netflix. Like, do you have to assume that the TV is set to shit? And he was like, no, but we do assume that they're going to watch it on a small TV. And I was like, that's an interesting point that I hadn't thought of. Well, I, maybe I had in the past, but I didn't really think about it. It was like, if everyone's going to be watching it on an iPad or like a, like a 27 or like a laptop, your framing changes, you know, you're not going to Yeah, no, but one point or his other point shooting like wide open at 1.4 looks great on an ipad and weird in a theater no of course for the theater it's different my my thing goes directly to television so my take is right there but an ipad is one is the best screen ever to watch anything i i think it's the most beautiful screen ever because the black is rich it's like it's gorgeous, the colors. The only thing with the iPad, there's a little tint of cyan, generally speaking, but I love the iPad, definitely. It's the only thing I watch my dailies on, actually. Yeah. Now, the thing the thing is that I'm trying to work with the ASC as much as I can eventually to get um, Sony, Panasonic, uh, Samsung, and Netflix, and uh, the Disney, and everybody say, look, it's simple. We do a show. We put it to your platform. Let's have a code. And this code should go directly to your television and your television should change completely to what it's supposed to be. And when the show is finished and you go back to your hockey game, well, it comes back super sharp with this stupid motion uh, blur, uh, anti-motion blur that is destroying our movies completely. So. Can we get there, please, 2023? I hope we can get there very soon because this is the worst thing ever. Seriously. It's, uh, I, I do my, my part whenever I go to a, a hotel or an Airbnb or whatever, I always change it <laughs> off a lot of attic. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. But, uh, you, but you have a good point though, because that's not a far off technology. I know, like, I have a PlayStation that I watch m- movies on, you know, 4K Blu rays, whatever. And, um, 
when you when you're playing a game, the TV and I have a TCL, you know, Chinese hundred dollar. It looks nice, but it's not like a yeah. you know, it's not a LG C one or whatever. Um, but when you when I'm playing a video game, it says game mode activated, and it'll say like your PlayStation. And then when I put a movie, yeah. it says game mode deactivated. It doesn't yeah, even on that. Well, the PlayStation doesn't, you know. So it should exactly. it should happen. Of course, it should happen. It, so should, it should be, be possible. I mean. And I mean, it's even like Sony makes TV, Sony produces film and TV show, and they put billions into this. I, I, it would be great that it would be like pioneers to just change that. Take talk to Amazon, make sure it's like they, they have enough money and thing to make it work. The technology should be simple. Yeah, figure out a way that it's just like uh, the TV understands the code from the server. As simple as that, you know. I think it's mm. it's gonna it's gonna be very very important very soon because yeah, when I go to my brother and I look at at, the, at the, I I watch on his TV. He should, look at my new TV; it's amazing. He put the movie The Matrix, the first Matrix, which is gorgeous. It was amazing film. I look at this, I'm like, oh my god, what happened to Carrie? This ain't right. <laughs> She's full of crater. Her skin is like full of pores. I'm like, what the hell is that? I've never seen this in my life. She's not like this. Is TV made her face look like she has like these big pores? So this is really bad. And you know, all the work, like we talk, come back to Percy about these lens and the skin and how gorgeous it is. It's it's for the the human to be pleased and 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 connect to. A, a, a character in, in a, a, a drama, you know? So it's it's like, it, it is important. It's not a joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also to the, uh, to finalize that point, like Netflix, I, I, I think, uh, has this thing where they, they don't put grain in the um, file that is sent. The grain gets added at the app level. Uh, so that it doesn't get mushy. Like the reason that you're able to see grain on Netflix is because it's added on your app or on your TV and not through the compression. Like, okay. so it doesn't get great. So there's gotta be a way to talk to TV. If you could do that, there's gotta be a way yeah. to tell the TV to turn on filmmaker mode. For sure. Um, I did want to, uh, I know we're, we're about out of time here. I did want to ask. Are you? Am I misquoting you? Or did you say that two of the influences for Percy Jackson were E.T. and The Green Mile? Or was that a different yes. film? No, no, no. So that's me saying that. So and this is very funny because <laughs> when I when I get a a, a call from my agent saying hey, they would like you to read the strip and so on, Percy Jackson. Of course, there was many DPs that being interviewed. So I get some the script. I read it. And what I usually do is I do a lookbook or a mood board uh, for my interview because it's for me to to express what I saw and what I think. So what I did on this one, and I always start with a page with five movie posters. Mm-hmm. But then I had like I said, okay, so this is the the the, the type of of uh, inspiration. So one of them is E.T. because of the the youth, the kid, the Spielberg way of shooting. Uh, there was Lord of the Ring because of the scope and the, you know, like we want some juicy big stuff. Uh, there was a, well, I don't remember, but at the end there was, my last poster was The Green Mile. And then the producer, John, uh, John Steinberg, <laughs> and Dan Schultz were like, okay, Pierre, at that what The <laughs> Green Mile. What the hell? Why do you come out with that? I want everyone to be sad? <laughs> and I, I know, and I said, well, listen, I said, because it's one of the b- most beautiful movie of two characters that are going through a journey that are completely different from race, from um, social uh, identity. One is a prisoner, one is a guard, one is black, one is white, one uh, one is huge, the other one is small. I mean, it's they they all and they're going to a journey, and it's very highly emotional. And I said, I don't know. When I read the script, this is where I would like this to go, because there's good lines in there. There's good, uh, there's good like uh, scenes, and there's some good scenes with Grover in him. And I could see, and it was his mom. And I said, I can see this going into adult life meaning seriousness you know so that's why that's that's why i think 
I put this. But to be honest with you, I don't really know. I just like, I'm just trying to get inspired. And then I was like, I was like, I don't know. I see the green mile. And it, it was very strange. But you know what? It's a very, I mean, uh, people should watch it. A lot of people probably never saw that movie because it's a bit older movie, but uh, it's very powerful. Well, you know what? I, uh, I just picked right there. Yep. Right about, right about there is uh, the 4K Green Mile because I heard that transfer was really good and I haven't watched it yet, but I do have the screeners for the rest of Percy Jackson because that's an advantage to being a journalist. So I'll watch that now and then I'll finish Perfect. the series. Then, and then I'll let you know, how, you know uh, what my opinions are. Okay. Uh, well, these are, these are inspirations, so maybe there's nothing into it. You know, it'll, it'll feel right, you know? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I told them that one of my pitch for the series was to, we should shoot it on an iPhone. <laughs> no kidding. This, yeah. And that was my, I said, we should shoot it. We should feel like it's shot on an iPhone, which is not at all. It's like super big and scopy and big cranes and everything, but it's still an inspiration. Meaning what I talked about this, it's I, I said, we need to talk to the young audience. We need mm -hmm. to talk to the adults. Actually, that's what Disney did the best when they started with Aladdin, you know, and then, and, and, and Shrek and everything that has become crazy where they talk to adults and kids and the adults are, were laughing like crazy in the theater and the kids don't know why, you know. So this is something very important. So this is mm -hmm. something that is probably part of it, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll let you get to what looks like the rest of your evening. Uh, but, uh, it was really fucking awesome talking to you, man. And the show's great. And uh, I'd love to have you back on to talk about... Uh, I guess the Dune series when, when that comes yeah. out or maybe before, if you're ever bored. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. No problem. I thanks. We haven't talked too much about Percy, but I think it was fun to talk generally about like, uh, cinematography because it's all, uh, it's all related. And, uh, thank you for, for having me. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. If you'd like to support the podcast directly, you can go to frameandrefpod.com and follow the link to buy me a coffee. It's always appreciated, and as always, thanks for listening.